Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the 10th day of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truly merciful. It's been a beautiful 10 days thus far and we continue making du'as that Allah accepts all of our efforts and truly blesses us and helps us get to the next level of forgiveness, spirituality, sabr, oneness as a ummah inshallah and all the beautiful things and all the beautiful virtues that we strive for in the month of Ramadan and let it not stop there let it not stop after the 30 days inshallah Allah give us the strength to carry it out throughout our lives inshallah so this morning on the 10th of day 10th day of ramadan once again i have saraya nawab from islamic care line to talk about one of the concepts not only in the month of ramadan but we as muslims need to carry throughout in our lives and it's that small word with a very deep and big meaning we're going to talk forgiveness and then we'll be looking at diet and lifestyle and exercise in the month of ramadan with a lovely shakir agur we're also going to be talking to a blogger and a brand analyst so all of that on the show we do hope you keep us company you probably are tired after the sahur and quran reading but this is your time to kick back relax watch the show interact with us if you can in Inshallah, and thereafter you can start with your Ramadan preparation. Suraya Nawab, Salaamu Alaikum, welcome to the program. Alaikum Salaam, Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh, and once again, thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here. We're going to unpack a very, very important word. It's a small word with huge repercussions, <coughs> deep meaning, and I think if you're able to embrace this concept, your life will be so much richer simply because you'll be more at ease with your spell, uh, self, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Forgiveness, I mean, we are humans, we go around trampling on other people's feet, other people do us down, other people stab us in the back. There's a lot of fitna, there's a lot of um, injustice in our homes, in our families and in society at large. So why is it so important for us as Muslims, very especially in the month of Ramadan, to embrace this concept of forgiveness. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, we into the, the second 10 days, and the second 10 days of Ramadan are identified by the days of forgiveness. The first 10 days are mercy, the second 10 days are forgiveness, and the third 10 days of the month of Ramadan are for repentance and seeking refuge. Um, so it's very apt that you're starting the 10 days off with this, with this topic. And at the outset, let me say, I, I'm not an alima, I don't have a Sharia qualification, so I, I'm not speaking from that perspective. I'm We're speaking, speaking from, from the perspective of women, of women, mothers. of human beings. Mm -hmm. And also, it's very apt for us at the Islamic Care Line because in terms of a couple reuniting with severe marital dysfunction, um, forgive, forgiveness plays such a big part in them coming together again because it's all about hurting each other in various ways and through the counseling process and that is something that the counselors would embrace because they'd look at this notion of forgiveness in an in a Muslim context, in a marriage, um, to say once you forgive each other, you can move on in this marriage. So for me, that is why forgiveness is, is as you said, a very small word, but it's such a loaded word. And um, the best example for me, the best example for me in terms of forgiveness, if I have to take from the, and the best uh, person that we can emulate is our noble prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And for me, when um, the conquest of Makkah happened, okay, during the, the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, and he was entering Makkah, and we all know the story that he was entering, entering as a victor. He was entering as the leader. He was entering as the master of 
all those people, all those Meccans who were still there. And he entered on his horse with the sword, was was his sword with him? And can you imagine the people? Can you imagine the Meccans who were there, who had taunted him, who had slandered him, who had abused him in the most physical and emotional ways possible? They actually drove him out of the city. Um, can you imagine how scared they must have been? I mean, he he they were at his mercy. He could have done anything with them. But what did the noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam do? He rode in with his camel on his on his camel, with his chin on the camel. Okay, not haughty, haughty and up and upright and I am who I am and I will do this and I will fix you up and not like that at all. He drove with his face down on the on his conveyance and he rode into into the um, into into Mecca he rode into he, into the sanctuary and where the, the the area of the the Kaaba is and all these people can you imagine waiting for him he got off he took his sword out and at that moment you can think what is going on in now his subjects the lives of his in the minds of his subjects he put it down and what did he do all he did was he took one of the he hit one of the idols with his sword hard and you know the idols were all around the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. He hit one of them really hard and there was a domino effect of all the idols around the Kaaba and that's how those idols were actually removed okay from from the sanctuary. And he put his sword down and all he did was forgave every single person that was there. No. So when we look at the capacity and the mercy and the beauty mm. and the magnanimity of our beloved Nabi Karim so Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we strive in the month of Ramadan, Allah gives us this opportunity to get our lives back in order. Yes. So we strive in this month to try and live up to all of his amazing, <coughs> noble characteristics. Yes. But this is something very difficult for us to do yeah. because the one thing I'm going to say to you uh, we were talking about it off air and um, you've, you've given me another perspective on the issue is a lot of people say whether it's, you know, troubled marriages yeah. or sibling relationships or whatever your relationship is, <coughs> you've wronged me, but I forgive you, yes. but I'll never forget what you did yeah. to me. For okay. me, that's almost um, a half, a, half, a forg half an apology or mm. half a, for a forgiveness. Mm. It's not letting go completely. Mm. Mm. I think there are two things there. The first thing is when you forgive somebody, it's not the person that is the subject of your forgiveness. You're actually forgiving yourself. Think about it. You, for, you need to forgive yourself for doing something bad. Okay? You need to be okay with it yourself. Right? And then you would ask for forgiveness from that person. But when that person forgives, they're also giving you something back. Okay, they're giving you your self-worth back. They're giving you a sense of, I'm not such a bad person after all, you know. Um, and in terms of forgetting, I, I, I tend to have two views on that. For me, um, and I heard one of the, the talks of um, Sheikh Umar Suleiman from America, and he has a very nice clip on YouTube, and, and the viewers can, can go and have a look at it. It's about, um, I will forgive you, but I will not forget. Exactly that, you know. And uh, according to him, he says that if, you, if you're going to hang on to it, then you, as you say, you're not truly letting go. But the other, the other part of that is that you're hanging on, but you're also remembering when you feel that hurt, I must not do this again. Ah, okay. To so, another person. Or the way so, I have been wronged, yes. I mustn't do this to somebody, somebody else. else. Because again, what does the seerah of the Prophet say? The seerah says that you can... If you are merciful to others, 
Allah will be merciful to you. Absolutely. If you forgive others, Allah will forgive you. And what do we do in all our lives every day in this Ramadan, knocking our heads on that Musallah? What? Asking for forgiveness from Allah Absolutely. because we have wronged ourselves mm -hmm. so much. The other example, again, that comes to my mind right now is there was a woman in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had had an, had an uh, extramarital um, uh, sexual relationship. She had born the baby, got, got fallen pregnant, had the baby, and she killed the baby. Okay, she killed the baby because she tried to uh, compensate for her sins. Okay, for her sins of having um, a sexual relationship and outside of marriage and falling pregnant. And then so she thought, you know what, this will be her compensation. But obviously it's not. And I mean, if you just think about that for us as Muslims, that's the worst, one of the worst forms of sin that you can, you can practice or you can be, uh, you know. And she came in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam listened to her and he was like fuming and he was, but we know that his demeanor was always calm and always soft and he never wanted to hurt any, any fellow Muslim and so she came to him and she confessed to him and she said you know I have done this but I'm feeling so bad about it that I need to I need to do something with myself to get over this and because he was so abhorrent of her acts of sinning he said to her and he the Quran every second line we read is what Allah is all forgiving most merciful so what did the Prophet Sallallahu did he said go and repent earnestly to Allah and Allah will forgive you but he said don't ever come in front of me again like don't be in my face don't remind me all the time of what you've done because just of just the, the actions that she had had acted out were so abhorrent to him so he said so that it, I, it's there and I know how bad is it, but you will remind me too much of it if you are in front of me. You know, I mean, he didn't say it in so many words. He just said, don't ever come again, in, come in front of me again. So, so for so me, then, there are two, ta two sides of forgiving and forgetting. Okay. So also you have in lots of families, you know, where you have family breakups, etc. Yeah. You'd get, and very especially <clears throat> in the month of Ramadan and, you know, we and... Uh, obviously, on the 15th of Shaban, you get all of these messages going yeah. around and people asking, okay. you know, asking for math and, you know, turning over new leaf, etc. Um, and, and, and of course, Ramadan is about renewing oneself. Yes. So, but then you also get those people where things have gone down so badly in families where they come to you and say, um, we ask for your forgiveness or I make you marv, but I prefer not to have a relationship with you going mm. forward. Mm. Let's, that, that ties in with what you said about yes. the, our beloved Nabi. Yes. Let's go for an ad break, inshallah. Okay. Suraya Nawab is here on the 10th of day of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, we're talking forgiveness. It's something we need to wrap our minds around because there are a lot of people we have wronged we need to think about how we're going to broach, uh, approach them, broach the subject of forgiveness, inshallah, and how we move on from there. Likewise, there's a lot of people who've wronged us and how we're going to respond when they come to ask for math. Lots more to come. We're going to be looking at diet in Ramadan, exercise and lifestyle, and lots more. Welcome back and Alhamdulillah, it is the 10th Mubarak day of the Mubarak month of Ramadan and Suraya Nawab from Islamic Care Line is here to talk to us about that small word with huge repercussions, forgiveness. And of course, in this month of Ramadan, we're all going to be going around knocking on doors and asking for maaf and we're going to also be asked by friends, family and relatives who have wronged us that we must forgive them as well. Uh, Suraya, is there a process? And I'm wondering the type of words to use. I'm thinking facial expressions. I'm thinking body language, etc. That's all very important because I could say to you, forgive me, but my body language is going to give me away. And it, you know, even though you've talked about, I don't have to forget, but um, it's the way I interact with you mm. at the point of forgiveness mm. is going to make both parties feel 
okay about the interaction and even if they part ways and never see each other again they are at peace so the so there are two issues here the issue around i forgive you but i refuse to have anything to do with you in future how do you respond to that and body language and facial expressions okay. so for me um, in terms of forgiveness there are two parts to forgiveness okay if we have to break them up the first is the forgiveness that we implore Allah to, to, to shower on us, okay? To bless us with forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done to the Almighty, okay? So that's one part. And that is what we read in the Quran. Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. To who? To a servant who has wronged himself and who fervently and, and expressly asks Allah with the intention of being forgiven and what and Allah Allah says I've got one percent of, of forgiveness for everybody on this earth for everybody on this earth okay but the 99 percent of forgiveness you'll get on the day of judgment so how merciful is Allah and how much full of forgiveness is Allah right so if we really ask with the intention of not entering or not doing that, that sinful action again, then Allah will, will definitely forgive us, right? So we, we're okay there. I think we <laughs> during our Ramadans and that we all, we all employ, we all ask for forgiveness and every one of us, even if it's only for that month of Ramadan, but we do it. So as Muslims, inshallah, Allah will forgive us, right? And, and so and there's another story of the, from the Seerah that says that there's a man that came, and I may be um, diverting a little bit, but the crux is that the man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, I have, I have sinned. And so the Prophet وسلم, said, go and ask genuinely and sincerely with tears in your eyes to Allah to repent uh, and repent to Allah and he'll forgive you and make sure that you do not do this again. And eight times this man came back and he said, but I'm so weak, I have done it again. And all, each of the eight times the Prophet sent him back because no human being, no matter what status they have, have the power of Allah. Okay, but that's the relationship we have towards the responsibility. It's hukukul ibad. It's, it's uh, hukukullah is, is our responsibility to Allah. Hukukul ibad is our responsibility to fellow human beings. Now, that is the second part of forgiveness. Allah will not, in a way, disenfranchise a next Muslim, the, the next Muslim if you... If the person that person is hurt does not forgive that person so this whatsapp message and, and i went to the umahat madrasa uh, ramadan madrasas on saturday last week and this is what i was just saying that this message that goes around this this wholesale message that we broadcast and rebroadcast a million times and forward really holds no weight because if you generally think about you and i generally we are okay with the acquaintances around us, work colleagues, family members. We're okay. It's one or two people, maybe some people have more than one or two people, hopefully not, um, that really had You've an wronged. incident. Yes. That you really, or somebody that has wronged you. So it's just a few people. So the right way she said to do it was to actually go to that person and ask it and that's what you're saying so if you go to a person your facial expression your humbleness your genuineness your sincerity in asking that person for maaf is is really an act of ibadat because it's very hard to do that we know that okay it's exceptionally hard to do that and so again it comes into yes you'll ask for forgiveness and then you tell the person but you know what let's just keep our distance and it's for okay me. it's and okay it's, to me, say you don't even have to say that you your your relationship with that person after that will say it because you won't be calling the person as often you'll just as you avoid him or you'll her. avoid you just do your duty like make salam um, if there is something in that person's life sickness or death or baby or anything like that you would go normally as you'd go and visit that person but you won't have the interaction, this is, I'm talking to somebody that's very close to you, maybe a sister-in-law, cousin-in-law, cousin, -in -law, cousin uh, uh, even sometimes even your own sibling. Even, even it's, it's even happening among <coughs> siblings. So you have this Muslim relationship because remember also we grew up knowing, learning that you cannot 
take a person out of your life and be enemies with them for more than three days. Or you, you know, we, we've grown up hearing that all the time. So that is also an injunction that says that as a Muslim, one Muslim to another, you have the courtesy as a Muslim. You know, the feeling as this is my Muslim sister or Muslim brother or whatever, you know. But, but you just, avoid that just, person just and that works very well. All right. Just what you've now said, it's probably the response to my next question, mm -hmm. which is, what happens if you've been wronged in such a big way or in such a bad way or vice versa that when this forgiveness um, scenario is playing out, mm -hmm. the party that has been wrong turns mm -hmm. around and says, I'm sorry, I can't forgive you. I can't accept it mm -hmm. and walks away. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about mm -hmm. a fellow Muslim. Yes. And I'm sure it's happened a no, lot of happens. times. It's happened. Uh, we've, we've, we've heard it in counseling. Um, he's hurt me so badly that there is no way I'm going to. I, I may go on, but there's no way I'm going to forgive him for this. Thus, he'll have to deal with Allah for. We hear that very often, right? And so for me, it's about that person then and their relationship with Allah. It, and also you do a disservice to yourself to some extent because you must know emotionally it hardens you. It as a you. as a from a counseling perspective, yes. but even from you're a not normal, at, you're not at peace, are no. you? Because you're carrying that poison, you're that toxin with you all the time. The time. So, and so, that, the, the opposite part is not even aware of how it's damaging yes, you. Yes, you carrying all the stuff they carrying on the for flag. me a way to do it, whether it's in counseling or out of counseling. If it was really something so hurtful, I would, I would. I would encourage the, 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 the two people, whether it's husband and wife or siblings or whoever, friends, whoever, to sit down and openly, genuinely talk about their feelings about that incident specifically, if it was that hurtful. So you can say to the person, yes, you're asking me for forgiveness and I will forgive you, but I need to let you feel exactly how badly you hurt me. You know, and then on the other hand, you'll get people who on a superficial level will say, oh, my mum or my sister said that uh, we're not on such good talking terms anymore. So I should um, I should phone and I should um, apologize to you. I should ask you for math. For me, you don't ask by proxy. For, yeah, uh, you don't. <laughs> you do not ask for forgiveness because somebody has asked you to do it. That that is the right thing for you to do. It should be an intention within you. It should be genuine. It should be sincere. It should. It should say, look, I I know I hurt you, but you know what? You also said a few things in that in that discussion now that hurt me as well. So let's talk openly about it and let's then put it aside. And we may, as you say, be acquaintances after this. We may see each other and greet. We may not go back to the relationship we did have, but at least it's put aside. Yeah. What about whilst you're having this discussion on forgiveness, mm. there's another blow up between the two of you? Mm. What, um, what happens then? I think, first of all, I think, I think then you should be the bigger person and say, listen, I, maybe this is not the right time to have spoken to you about it, but um, maybe think about what we've said. And at some point when you are ready, let's talk about this because I don't want to go around feeling this bad about you or what I did to you or what you did to me. So let's stop now because this is not going anywhere. So I think that would you'd be the bigger person. And at that point, if you feel, look, I'll say this, but I'll also say this to you, that I'm ready to forgive you. You know, so it depends on how you are going to accept my forgiveness. OK, okay we come about to the end of the show, believe it or not. So I'm going to leave you to wrap up in the next minute, inshallah. OK, the thing about uh, a person that says uh, I will not forgive you is that again at the Madresa on Saturday, we, we learned this. And, you know, there's that the, the bridge of Kantara. When you when Allah says, OK, you passed, you going into Jannah, <laughs> right? And we all standing in this line and we all going before you enter the gate that is designated to you, there's this bridge of Kantara. And on that bridge are all those people that you have wronged, wronged. in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And each one of them will say to Allah, but you can't let this person go into Jannah because she did this to me and she did that to me. And, she, and Allah will ask you and you will say, no, I don't even know who you are, <laughs> you know? And then Allah will zip your mouth 
and your body will start speaking and say, yes, this is what you did. And then there are options on whether you give your good deeds to that person and it's a bartering thing for you to get back to get into that door. So for me, um, there are so many stories from the seerah, there's so many stories from the Quran. Let's just in closing then ask you the issue around the importance of forgiveness in the month of Ramadan. With my, one minute I, to go. I, I, I don't think there's any time in our lives more important for, for the month, during the month of Ramadan than to ask for forgiveness, number one. Number two, um, it's an opportunity. Allah has opened the door for you for a whole month to, to pour your heart out, to, to make amends. Even if you have this person that said, I want nothing to do with you, in Ramadan, visit them. If they're ill, or go to their home, just have a short visit, just to give them the feeling that, you know what, the, the, the worst is behind us, you know, and then beg from Allah. And what more than begging for Allah for our own forgiveness, but also for the forgiveness, forgiveness of people around us. Absolutely. So I think Allah, Ramadan is a, is a special time for us that Allah actually gives us. It's how much use we make of that time. Absolutely. So for me, that is so, Shukran so important. Shukran very, very much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept Ameen. all your efforts Ameen. and Islamic care line and Ameen. can't wait to talk to you again. Inshallah, Ameen. have a Mubarak rest of Ramadan. Oh, and exactly. there you have it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us as Muslims. We have an entire month, 30 days to put our houses, our lives and our issues back on track, back in order. We renew ourselves, our lives, our bodies, our minds, our spirits. Allah gives us this opportunity once a month to become reborn, I should imagine, pardon, once a year to be reborn, if I can put it uh, lightly. So we're given this opportunity every year, every year for 30 days to renew ourselves, to become better, uh, better Muslims, better human beings, and to start afresh. Alhamdulillah, still to come, we're going to now talk food, diet, and nutrition. The 10th day of Ramadan and it's great to be in your company. Of course, in the first part of the show, we spoke about forgiveness. Alhamdulillah. May the people we've wronged in our lives accept our apologies. May they let go and allow us to let go and move on to bigger and better things, inshallah. Now, part of Ramadan, when Ramadan starts, and if you're a fitness fanatic, if you gym regularly, or if you've been dieting, you're kind of a bit nervous about the fact that everything needs, you know, well, your exercise routine is interrupted, and perhaps your dieting, uh, your diet changes because we eat differently in the month of Ramadan. But uh, nutritionists, dietitians, and fitness gurus tell us that we don't have to make drastic changes, that we can still carry on doing the kind of things that's going to enhance our well-being and still continue having a very spiritual Ramadan. And so says my next guest. She is Shakira Gur and she runs a, a, a fitness a studio which is called a Fitness Fusion. She's right here to talk to us about it. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the studio. <laughs> nice to have you here. Now, I'm a walker. I walk regularly for about five kilometers a day. But at the beginning of Ramadan, or a few days before Ramadan, I just stop walking simply because my take is that I'd rather spend that time in my prep or my ibada, etc. But I guess when you look at it that way, you can also be saying to yourself that looking after my body taking care of my body and thinking about my body in a healthy way is also in Ibada. It is, yeah. I think uh, the day is long, so there's enough time in the day, even if it's a 15-minute walk. You don't have to do your normal, I don't know how long you walk for, 30, 30 to 45 minutes. If you, if you shorten it, maybe 15 minutes, just keep the body moving, keep the blood flowing. You can still do it. And in what? that time, you can also just reflect. You can think about... How, what you want to do that day or how much you want to read. No, but that is true. That yeah. is my, um, my alone time, my me time. When I walk, I do a lot of reflection because I'm alone. So it allows me to reflect and, you know, kind yeah. of get uh, my headspace right. But before we get to all of that, let's understand who is Shakira. Why is fitness such a passion with you? So I own Fitness Fusion. 
I'm based in Houghton. I've been in Houghton since 2012 now. So it's uh, six years. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was at a smaller studio in Santon at my house, and then I moved everything to Houghton. And um, I actually didn't study. I went to Cape Town. I studied um, business science, and I ended up doing marketing. But I found fitness in between all this, and since then, it's been my passion. I haven't worked one day in an office, mm -hmm. and this is my work. It's what I just. It's what I do. It's my pur pur purpose and my passion. How seriously are people, very especially women, taking their fitness these days? And how would they know that what they are doing, the type of exercises they are embarking on, is good for them? I, um, nowadays, it's, I think women are much more into it. In the beginning, I had like a few ladies, and now if you come to the studio, we're six instructors and each instructor is fully booked at the that moment. That big? Yeah, sure. So it's very busy. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's only ladies. We do cater for males in like um, an odd hour, like maybe 6 a.m. because there's no ladies usually at that time. So we have maybe like three males. The rest are all women and, it, and they're very serious about it. And I think as uh, I do a lot of, I do Pilates. I specialize in Pilates. So I've got um, young girls with no issues, no body aches, nothing. And then I've got my oldest uh, ladies are in their 60s, late 60s. So it just, uh, we tell them what they can and can't do. And does Pilates then help with aches and pains? Lots, yeah. <laughs> so it's right. strength based, uh -huh. but it's, uh, it's no impact. Okay. Um, when we talk fitness, uh, we're talking different forms of exercises. Is it as easy as perhaps just waking up one day? Uh, let's assume people don't come to you because I should imagine when they come to you, you consult with them, you take a history yeah. and um, obviously work around. You uh, tailor make an exercise um, plan, okay, yeah. especially for them. But somebody watching us this morning realizes just how important exercise is and should be in their lives. And post Ramadan decides, well, I'm going to start walking or cycling or running or whatever it is that suits, you know, takes their fancy. Is it as easy as that or is it better to perhaps consult with someone like you to understand exactly what their bodily and lifestyle needs are and then cater specifically for that? I think in, uh, if you really are new to exercise, it's always good to consult with the expert. So even, I mean, every, obviously there's different areas, you always find somebody. But if you can't get to somebody or if, you, if it's, um, the times don't suit you or even if it's unaffordable, there's always a way. So you can look up on the internet, you can Google stuff, you can Google exercises. And then the best thing, like you say, is walking. Just start with walking. If you mm -hmm. start, get yourself out there, start moving. Once you start moving, it's very difficult to stop. And then you just want to keep going. And then you'll learn new, new um, forms of exercise and you'll actually be more confident to train with a trainer. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the different types of exercises you offer and the one thing I do want to ask you about is when I knew I was coming on this program someone said to ask you about the Orbi track or Orbi trek. Um, it's like an exercise bicycle but not quite. What can you tell us about that? Would that, if, if you decide that that's the only thing you're going to do for 15 minutes or half an hour a day, how is it going to enhance your general health and well-being for the orbitrex specifically i yes. think it's a you can buy it and use it at home yes yeah so you can i mean it's obviously it's a form of movement it's it's probably in one plane but you it's movement it's like walking with your arms with your arms so, and yeah, your legs obviously your arms and legs so together, you would yeah. benefit from it for sure yeah okay any kind of movement you benefit from all right. Yeah. Um, coming back to exercise, lifestyle, healthy eating, etc. When you assess a person for the type of exercise regime you're going to plan for them, um, do you also work out a diet plan for them? Uh, so it depends. I work with a qualified dietitian also who's um, based at the studio at times. And then we usually do the eight week challenges together. So the eight week challenge is a program I've come up with and I've been doing it now for two years where um, the ladies sign up and we give them an eating plan and a workout plan and they train at the studio with me and then they also work out at home. 
Gee, so, was this sounds um, amazing. So yeah. you talk about this eight week challenge. Is it for weight loss only? And I should imagine because you working with different age groups, different weight groups, different lifestyles, that each eight week challenge is specifically tailor made for the person concerned. Yeah, so that's the difference with ours is that it's specific to the person. So the dietitian consults with them one on one and then we work together and then the exercise is not one on one, it's in a group which is amazing because it's the women just motivate each other like you can't believe. So I take about a maximum of 15 ladies and then we work um, together with the exercises, so different levels. There might be someone, I've had ladies who have never exercised in their life and then some who are like fitness pros and they're in the same group. And, it's and when you talk about this eight week plan of yours, um, do they have to come in regularly for an hour per day? And what sort of losses have you had in terms of um, success, you know, weight loss yeah. successes? So it's usually three times a week with me, I train them and then if we Sometimes on the weekend we get together for outdoor workout or something. And then um, I've had such good results, I wish I had some pictures. But the, um, the, I've had like, in terms of weight loss, like about nine kilos in eight weeks, which is a lot. I don't, I don't even encourage so much weight loss, but it just happens because people just start eating healthy and just start living the healthy life. But the main focus for me besides the weight loss is the learning to eat healthy learning to nourish your body, learning to eat wholesome food. For now, me, there the is, thing. obviously, there's a risk here in terms of, very especially when you talk nine kgs, that's a huge amount of weight to lose in a short space of time. Um, and the risk is that because you've lost in such a short space of time, you can put it on as mm. quickly as well. So what is it, um, and I'm sure that you have to motivate them by the way you interact with them as well, because it's not only about the exercise and the eating, you play a big role in yeah. their lives as well by this constant motivation and inspiration. So what are the type of things you kind of, um, say to them when they attend the sessions to keep them grounded and to keep sticking with the diet and the exercises. So what we do is we have a WhatsApp group, all of us and um, all the participants and me, and then we'll chat all the time, like we'll put recipes up and we'll, oh, um, wow. it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a really a nice group. It's all different every time, obviously, but I've had some girls who start and then they feel like they still want to go on, like, um, say they feel they haven't reached their goal, then they'll do it again. I've had some girls now on the third round and they just keep going because they feel like they need someone to motivate them. So they're scared if they go home, are they going to cope? But usually my, the girls after the eight weeks, I still see them because they come for training and they, um, they cope. It's do you give them a maintenance plan? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also they learn how to eat healthy, mm -hmm. healthily. So um, it's not about just going on this eight week diet. It's about, I teach them how to eat well. Okay, what about binge eating or binge dieting or yo-yo dieting for that matter? How, um, you know, these days there's, uh, I mean, there's um, countless amounts mm. and numbers of diets on, you know, on the market and uh, people would try and test a whole host of different ones. Would you say that's detrimental to the health? Would you encourage it not? Uh, is it about, uh, well, try as many as you like and then stick with something that suits you and works for you? Yeah, there's just too many things out there now and people just Google stuff and also people hear from other people and then they want to try it. But that everything um, doesn't work for everyone. True. And then the, the diets generally don't work. I just, I don't believe in um, short-term diets. I don't believe in diet pills, all those kind of things I believe in learning how to eat, so eating all food groups, not cutting out any food groups, um, except sugar, of course, and then um, just learning how to feed your body according to what your body needs. Okay, let's go for an ad break. When we come back, we're going to talk about exercise and diet in the month of Ramadan, inshallah. Shanki Raghur is my guest. She is a fitness instructor. She is with Fitness Fusion. They're based in Houghton, Johannesburg, and it's all about healthy eating, healthy living, and of course, exercise. No pain, no gain, so says Shakira. Stay with us. We'll be back to talk some more.
Welcome back. The 10th day of the Mubarak month of Ramadan. We're talking exercise, we're talking fitness and we're talking diets. And of course, it doesn't mean that everything has to stop as long as you do carry on, continue uh, your exercise and eat healthily. Perhaps you need to be cutting down on the time you spent exercising, and I'm sure Shakira is going to agree with me on that point, but you don't have to stop completely because I think when you try and get back into it after I'm done, it's going to be a bit of a stretch for you. Would I be correct in thinking that? Yeah, definitely. Because all the, the whole year you're working so hard, right? and then you reach your goals, and then suddenly for four weeks you just stop. It's actually a shock to your system. So it's better to carry on, even if you tone it down a bit, you slow down. And then when you get back into it afterwards, it's easier. Just so what happens in. with people like myself? I've told you that I'm a walker. I walk for about five kilometers. I walk for about an hour per day. I've stopped completely. Um, what's going to happen to me after Ramadan? And how do I ease myself back into my walking? Because I'm certain I'm going to have aches and pains. Yeah, so that, I think that would be key, that you just ease yourself into it slowly. So don't go into a straight one hour fast brisk walk on the first day. Take it easy, do a um, slow walk and then fast, slow, fast like that for maybe 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. then the next day you can increase by five minutes each day. Mm -hmm. But by within a week you should be fine. What about, um, all right, now I've, I've just stopped it. I'm sure there are a lot of women um, and people who are fitness fanatics, alhamdulillah for that, that still continue through the month of Ramadan. How strenuous is it for them? You know, I'm thinking of a fasting man or woman um, going for, you know, spending an hour at a gym or, you know, your ladies' classes, the women still continue coming. Um, is it going to impact them in any way in terms of maybe being very fatigued at night or possibly um, becoming more thirstier than normal? Um, and, and in terms of diet changes, how's that all going to impact on them? Uh, by me, most of the ladies continue. They, uh, what we do is we just change the classes a bit. So all of us know, I mean, even the non-Muslim instructors know. So what we, we cut down on the cardio and we'll do only Pilates. And then we also do a lot of stretching because you'll find in Ramadan your body just gets stiffer because you're having less water. You feel like pulling down your legs and stuff. So it helps to do a lot of stretching. And then also foam rolling, which is a, uh, what we do at the studio, also helps. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, most of them continue. I was actually surprised this year. This year is the, the most ever. Like the ladies just haven't stopped. So this do you good. shorten the time of the exercises or do you just go in for gentle exercises? Yeah, we don't shorten the time. The classes are still an hour, but we do much more gentle exercise. In terms of the ladies or anybody for that matter watching us this morning, they may not be at a formal gym, but they do all of the exercises and healthy eating at home. Would you suggest that they change their eating habits in the month of Ramadan? I mean, we can't help it. We prepare these sumptuous meals for our loved ones, very especially for the men in our lives. We have a lot of fried foods, you know, lots of savouries. Um, a lot of people have milkshakes and the extras that go with, you know, your Ramadan meal. What's your, um, what's your uh, advice as far as that is concerned? And women who've been on special, men and women who've been on special diets, do they continue in Ramadan or can they indulge and perhaps do some sort of catch up or payback after mm -hmm. Ramadan? I think uh, for me, I just believe that you, you shouldn't add in all the extra meals. And this, I know that this, it's hard. We invite people over, you want to make the nice different things. But every day when you're at home, try to stick to how you were eating. There's no need to add in all the extra savouries, especially the fried foods and even the milkshakes. Like you say, it's all full of sugar. It's just adding on calories, which you're not going to burn because you're going to you, you less, you're moving less. So I think uh, stick to the way you were eating. If you were following a specific diet or uh, eating plan, try to stick to it and just eat healthy. There's certain people who, even though you have fries and a lot of other very rich foods and sugary foods, during the month of Ramadan, that uh, they lose weight, or on the other op on the other side of the spectrum, people who put on weight try as hard as they do to eat healthily, they still put on weight. What's your advice to them? Those that lose the weight yeah. um, and those that put on weight. 
Uh, I think weight loss in Ramadan, a lot of time it's muscle mass. Like I know for myself, I lose, if I have to weigh myself, I'll lose on the scale, but it's all muscle. Like I'll be so weak after the four weeks because I've lost muscle and then within two weeks I gain it back again. Is there and anything, then, is there any supplements or anything that one should be doing not to lose muscle? And what's the difference between muscle weight and actual weight loss? Um, if we do a, do certain tests, like if we test your body fat and stuff, it'll come out how much your muscle mass is and how much your fat, fat mass is. So obviously you want your muscle more than your fat. But what happens in Ramadan, I find because I'm not doing as much exercise as I do normally and I do a lot of weight training and strength training, I do lose muscle. So your weight generally goes down. And you Is can it even bad it. for your body to lose muscle? No, it's okay. It's only four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, because I find it very hard to do um, the type of exercise I normally do. I, I train hard and I train uh, with heavy weights and stuff. So it's very difficult for me in Ramadan specifically. But you get a lot of um, uh, like males and young guys that are still training and they're doing their weight training. So they'll keep their muscle mass up because mm -hmm. they'll supplement it with the right food. How good or bad is it for them? They're fasting and they continue doing very rigorous exercises. Um, are they at risk of perhaps injuring themselves? No, I don't think so. I think their bodies are so used to it. And they also, um, they're eating enough for the exercise. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing is that you must, because we're eating so little, like you, you tend to lose your appetite also a little bit. But uh, if they, their goal is to, to maintain their muscle, they'll eat as much, they know. So they'll maintain it with the food basically. People are still involved in high impact or strenuous exercises in the month of Ramadan. You also have a lot of Amin folk who go out and play golf in the month of Ramadan whilst they fasting and other activities. Should you be adjusting their diets? Should you be giving them more of certain types of food? I'm now thinking the high proteins or the type of foods that give you energy. What would those be and what would you encourage? And also in the same breath, you know, we look at people who, you know, the frail and the elderly and the sickly people. What should we be doing differently without giving them empty, you know, sugars yeah. um, and give them food that is truly going to sustain them and be good for their bodies. You need to make sure like at Seri time you eat um, a nice healthy breakfast. So if you eat low GI foods and then a good portion of protein and then some healthy fats also to keep you going. And then you have, um, so don't just have like examples. A, um, you can have oats, nice cooked oats with some almond milk and some nuts over it and then also some uh, or some almond butter and then it's nice to put a scoop of protein powder in that also is just give you added protein uh, it's more for the young younger people I, I um, advise that otherwise some almonds and then uh, you can also make a shake a nice uh, oats and some protein powder banana almond butter dates those kind of things and then if you, because I'm also active during the day, so because I have ladies coming in every True, hour. Yeah. So I have to eat at that time. So if I have oats, I'll still have a slice of um, a nice health bread with almond butter on it. And then I, I like to have tea because I'm a teapot. So I have to have tea at Ceres. So I'll have tea with my toast. Uh, the issue around, and very especially you who is a fitness coach, um, we are told not to have teas and coffees or try and minimize it because it's a diuretic mm. and you're going to probably be, um, you know, dehydrated Thirsty. during the day. Your take on it? How do you counterbalance that? Sure, it's so hard because uh, we're so used to drinking the tea and I found over time, I found that one cup at Seri actually just helps me during the day, especially now because it it's pulls late. You through. Yeah, it pulls me through. Because I get a headache, like especially that first week, everyone's like feeling miserable, they're missing their coffee, their tea. Mm. And I find um, I don't sleep after Seri, so it's like my day is starting like a normal day, have my tea and uh, with my breakfast. Like Those on. people that battle with, um, you know, becoming dehydrated during the day, do you think it's a good idea that they take, um, they hydrate themselves by taking those um, rehydrate mixes that you buy over the counter? I suppose if they're really feeling very dehydrated, then it's a good idea, yeah. But the, uh, yeah. that's if they're very dehydrated, mm -hmm. like not just normal thirst and you think you're dehydrated. Um, people who continue exercising during the month of Ramadan, it, they, they, even some people who don't, but suffer from uh, ongoing cramps, um, what would you suggest that they do 
yeah, to I've, circumvent, I've, uh, circumvent that issue. Um, I've, I actually heard that this week from one of my ladies. She was saying she's getting a lot of cramps. It's because we're not drinking enough water. So you need to drink enough water at Seri and then again at uh, Iftar and before you go to bed. And then also you, must, um, you can consult with your doctor, but a magnesium supplement usually helps with cramps and a banana also. So make, try and get in a banana every day. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, your advice as far as uh, vitamins, multivitamins, etc. are concerned, is it a good idea, very especially in Ramadan, does it do you any good? I, I continue with my normal uh, vitamins. The most important thing that I take is a probiotic. Um, and usually the best ones to take are the ones that are stored in the fridge at the scam. They're usually veggie caps, one a day at Seri, and it really helps. It's like if you struggle with IBS, tummy cramps, a lot of acid in your stomach, this keeps you going. And then, like I said, a magnesium supplement's also good if you're struggling with cramps. And then I usually take omega-3s, so I'm continuing with that. But What's the omega-3 for? Brain health or heart yeah, health? For brain. Brain health. Yeah, it helps okay. with the memory. <laughs> but it's also just good for your hair, skin, your nails, everything. So continue with that. And at night, it's better for that, so you don't have the taste of it in your mouth. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Lovely talking to you. And I'm so glad nice. you're here yeah. to just reassure everybody, very especially those very uh, energetic people, people are very into sport, etc., that you don't have to stop in the month of Ramadan. Yeah. You can still plan your timetable, make your time designated time for Ibadah, etc. Cut down on the exercise, go continue with it, but just cut back a bit so that you're still fit, healthy, and of course a healthy body results in a healthy, healthy mind. mind. Yeah. Shukran very much for being with us. I'll give you a visit sometime soon after Ramadan and you see must. what your outfit looks like. <laughs> you must be waiting for you. <laughs> Shukran. That was the lovely Shakira Guru talking about fitness fusion and the fact that you don't have to stop your exercise regime or your diet in the month of Ramadan. If you plan well in advance and you plan properly, you can be fit after Ramadan, throughout Ramadan, of course, you'll have lots of energy. You'll be able to do the extra ibadah. You can be able to do more ibadah in the middle of the night inshallah and you'll still be fit right after Ramadan as well so healthy eating healthy exercise though you're going to cut back on the exercise but you do and you can and you should continue with it so says our expert Shakira Gur. Welcome back. We started the show out this morning by talking forgiveness. We then moved on to diet and exercise and the fact that one shouldn't necessarily stop your diet or your exercise routine in the month of Ramadan. And now we move on to writing and blogging. Blogging is a big thing these days and lots of people have become bloggers. Let's understand why and the what's in it for me if I become a blogger. My guest is an ex-journalist. I don't think if you've been a journalist or writer, you could ever become an ex but anyway she comes from a journalistic background she is now a blogger and her name is Melissa Javan morning welcome to the program Good morning thank you lovely to have you here and um, I would be correct in saying that you can never be an ex journalist the writer in you will always be there yes yes and the fact that you're a blogger tells us that you continue your writing yes that's true what would you say is the difference between a journalist writing for a media platform um, as opposed to doing your own personal blog? Mm. So with journalism, there's certain standards, a criteria that you have to follow. And when you do a story, you have to check your facts, you have to do research, and you have to get different people's voices in the story. Um, I can't, for example, write a story on, on you and then not get your opinion on it or your version of the story. Whereas um, if you blog, it's mostly an opinion-based thing. You can do your research and, and get some stats um, on whatever you want to post. Like if, you, if you're doing something industry-based, you want to talk about um, statistics within the market you you can go get that um, that research but it's not the same as journalism because journalism 
you have certain standards and there's ethics, there's rules that you have to follow. Sure, and parameters and confines yes. within, within which you have to work. Yes. Now, what's in it for you or what would it, what would the, you know, what's in it for me if I become a blogger and why would anybody want to follow me? What do I have to offer and what's mm. in it for me? I think it starts with who you want to write for. Um, if, if you decide who do you, you want to write for, um, that, that gives you some kind of purpose. If you decide that you want to be a mommy blogger, you want to write for your children about the experiences that you have encountered as a mother and just documenting your, your life and their lives, you can do that. If you feel that you are an entrepreneur, um, I feel that a lot of entrepreneurs should use blogging because it's a, it's, a good, it's a good way to get visible and it's also a good way to get trust from customers and, and, and people out there. So for me, I use blogging as a networking tool. Um, for example, I, I did a series on mentorship and um, I spoke to um, people that I admired and they got to know me, I interviewed them and um, I, I put that stories on, onto my blog and um, whatever topics you want to do, um, if, if you're in the marketing industry or in the journal, uh, journalism industry, you can go um, and you use blogging as, as a tool to, to network with people, get to know people. And Apart from the networking, mm. what else is it? Uh, what else is there in it for you? I'm thinking monetary, um, you know, uh, rewards, for example. Mm. Is there any of that involved, or is it just about putting yourself out there, almost as a marketing tool, mm. and just expressing yourself or expressing views that you hold strongly? So there's different ways of making money with blogging. A lot of people don't actually make money. It's something that you can learn to do. Um, it depends on how consistent you are with your blogging and also your following. Um, for example, I'm, I'm doing personal finance at the moment and um, I'm teaching people about how I'm learning how to save money, how to pay off debt. So if, if there's brands out there that um, are in the finance space, they might want to use me to... to, to um, advertise on your page. Yeah, to advertise on my page, or I might advertise on my social media platforms. I might, through a blog post, tell people, okay, this is why I think this product will be good for you and why you should use this. So you, uh, the blog can be used as a platform to advertise. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it's also a platform where you can get to know people. And, and a lot of bloggers use it now as a tool to um, where they have campaigns. Like if you are an organization, the so NPO or NGO, you can use blogging to, to share what your organization is doing. And that way, the brands or whoever, they gain trust in what you do because they see and they, they see your visibility, um, they see what you're doing and that way people want to invest in you and what you're doing. So what does it cost you to blog on a daily basis mm. or as regularly as you do? Mm. And what are the criteria involved? Like you spoke about journalism, mm. the obviously the research, uh, mm. right of reply, etc., etc. But with blog blogging, it's really you are talking about your personal experience yes. or your thoughts about a certain product, etc. Yeah. But are there any criteria involved in terms of guiding principles as far as blogging is concerned? Um, I think at the moment there's this thing where people say anyone can be a blogger. Um, it's something that you learn as you go along. Writing is something, the more you do it, the better you, better you get at it. So um, whether you are a mother or you have a, a business, um, you're a life coach or whatever you do, you're a teacher, 
you can use blogging um, whatever way. It's just that the more you write, the better you get. And a lot of people now, um, you, they don't just use the, the, plat the blogging platform as the writing part. You can also do vlogs where you do videos of yourself oh, or wow. you, can, you can do audio where you use, if you don't want to write, then you, you can record yourself and then you post that SoundCloud clip on your blog and people can listen to that. So there's different forms of blogging and the cost is not that much. Um, it, it depends on, on where you buy your do domain. So if, if my, my domain first was a WordPress domain, it was melissa.wordpress.com. But if you want people to take your, you seriously, you have to get your own domain. So it's now melissajavan.com. So my, my um, domain is self-hosted and um, I have a hosting company. You can pay as little as 30 Rand or 40 Rand per month for a, a domain hosting. And then um, the other extras could be that you, um, you might ask someone to design a logo for for your your website and the yoga the logo can be be used to put on pictures that you put on or whatever because branding is also an important part of of business mm -hmm. and also and your are, blog there are a lot of women who have these food blogs don't they yes recipes and stuff yes. they've tried out with pictures etc yes how do you get people to um follow you you know to to, to read your blogs yes is there a platform where you advertise um, what you're going to be writing about or uh, that, you know, you steer them in that mm. direction that they start reading your blogs? Yes, there is. Um, do you know Pinterest? Mm -hmm. So Pinterest is a tool that bloggers use to market their, themselves or their recipes. So if you have a, a, a vegetable recipe, you can on your blog, you can post it, make make a pinned post of it, and then you can put that on Pinterest. There's also so social media. You can create your own page on Facebook, and then you can also tell your friends and family about your blog posts. Um, what we also do, um, a lot of the bloggers, is we have blogger groups on Facebook or on Twitter, and then we read each other's stuff, we share each other's stuff. And so you become a community? Yes, there's a lot of communities All in right. the blogging world. Uh -huh. So if, if for, for instance, there might be a few food bloggers that come together and then they share each other's stuff. And so your audience will see my stuff and my audience will see your stuff. So. Um, that's also another tool of marketing. Mm -hmm. I think the important part of blogging is to market your stuff. Okay, and finally, with two minute, minutes to wrap up time, mm -hmm. you've started a whole host of blogs, but now you particularly invested in managing your money or your finances. Yes. Why was it important to write about that? So I, um, I think it was last year, I was overwhelmed with sadness because I was in debt and it felt like I lived um, month to month and from hand to mouth. So um, I started reading some finance, personal finance blogs and then it made, it made me decide to document how I, how I pay off my debt. That's very personal yes. and are you comfortable putting comfortable putting such personal stuff out on the blog because probably hundreds of thousands of people read about it and they know your story. Yes, yes. The thing is, um, I think a lot of us, we, we share very personal things and then whenever you post something that's very personal, you feel like, uh, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? But once it's out there, then you get or an overwhelming response from people because uh, I got people telling me I'm going through the same thing wow. and there was one lady that told me you know I want to save money I just don't know how to do it 
And so you feel you're not alone in this yeah, and it's, you, I feel you've touched I, lives. Yes, yes. Okay. I feel I'm not alone. And after I did, I started, a, it's called the Money Mistake Series. So I started um, documenting all the mistakes I did with my um, money, financial mistakes that I did. And then one day I just decided, okay, I'm going to put out a tweet on Twitter where I asked people, is there anyone that want to share their money mistakes, um, fin bad financial decisions that they've made? And I, I got a lot of people coming to me and I have a lot of people since I think January, um, there, there, there has been interviews of people. Um, one lady s said that she took out a loan to pay off loans. Oh. Yeah. Borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. And so people tell their money mistakes yeah. and then they also tell the lessons that they've learned. And so we, we, we kind of learn that you are not alone mm. and we, you should learn from each other. Right. Yes. And finally, in a minute, what would you like to tell our viewers this morning about blogging and all the mistakes you've made? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that blogging is a, is, it's really, it's a good networking tool. Um, there's a saying that your, your network is your net worth. Ah. Yeah. Okay. And I found that um, I'm free. I'm a freelance writer at the moment. I found that since I've been retrenched, there's a lot of people that in my blogging um, community that came out to help me with um, giving me tips on interviews. And there's been people that I've met um, within the recruitment um, industry, people that help, help me set up jobs and all of those things. So it expands your network. So it's a good thing if you start blogging because You'll, you'll expand your network. So there's a lot of support out in the virtual world. Yes, there is. And that's where we leave it. Yes. Melissa Siobhan sharing her blogging stories with us, telling us why it's important to blog, why she's become a blogger. And I don't think she's looked back. She certainly seems to be enjoying it. And it has grown her network and her net worth. Stay with us. Our final interview is standing by to join us. Welcome back. I think uh, the final interview for this morning is a very natural follow on to the previous interview with Melissa where we spoke about writing and blogging because Melissa spoke about network and net worth. Our next guest is Alicia Pina and I hope I've said that correctly and she's here to talk to us about building brands and why brand building is so important. Ali, morning, good morning and welcome to the good program. Good morning, thank you so much for having me. Lovely to have you here thank and you. I don't think I pronounced your surname correctly. No, you got it perfectly. Did I get it yes. right? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> you look great by the thank way. Thank you very much. And it's great to have you in studio today. Thank you. Now, I know marketing people mm -hmm. and the corporate world and I guess celebrities mm -hmm. as well are big on brand and brand building. Yes. Why is it so important? Branding is life when it comes to business. Without a brand, you pretty much don't exist. And so that is why I think celebrities and big corporate companies pay so much attention to branding because it's all about how you portray yourself to the world. So if you think of design as a face, the brand is the smile. And without that smile and welcoming people into your space, people might not necessarily correspond with you very well. So branding is essential to a business and to establish a business um, within its environment. But it also gives the business the opportunity to come across as something important or uh, cohesive or a professional. Um, so that's why branding for companies, but also personal branding is starting to become so important in the sphere. All right, we're going to talk about how different is corporate branding versus personal branding we'll talk logos as well etc but who is Ali and why she's so passionate about branding okay so I started this journey um, a good 10 years ago and I wasn't always into design I was always an artist 
that I studied law and politics and I met some art kids and I saw what they were doing and I was like, gosh, people can do this for a living. And so I studied design and I got my bachelor's in design. But it was through the process of working with some really incredible companies and some really incredible brands that I started to really understand not only the importance of design within the world in general, but my passion for it and everything design. And as my sort of you know, story progressed, I started to get more and more into the branding aspect of design as opposed to the advertising aspect of design. And I started to build that and eventually decided to go out on my own and empower and help other entrepreneurs to build successful brands that will catalyze their business and help their businesses grow. When you talk design, are you talking, for example, graphic art and design? Yes. Is that a big part of obviously your work is um, uh, yes. branding it's actually a small part ah. okay so there's a difference I'm a brand strategist but you have graphic designers and graphic designers are more focused on the visual aspect of what is being portrayed but that's also important it is, is, it is not? also very because important because you kind of almost identify the brand yes. with the visuals that Absolutely. attach to it but the visual has to have a strategy Without the strategy, the visual stands for nothing. How many logos have you gone by and you've looked at them and they've sort of not stuck in your brain because there wasn't a strategy behind it? Or it the, the, the colors out. are not right. right exactly. You look at something and you think, cheapers, but that's ugly. Exactly. You so know? the brand's the personality of a mm. business and the visual should portray that personality. But without the strategy, without deciding what that personality is going to be, the visuals don't stand for much. So at, at my biggest mission in life at the moment is to educate people People, why a brand is so important. You can have a logo, but a logo doesn't count for anything unless you have a strategy and an entire brand in place and that logo corresponds throughout your business and actually speaks to what your business is about. So what you're saying is that the logo has to almost express your vision, yes. mission, etc. Absolutely. But now how is that different? So I can understand this in a corporate environment or a corporate sp space, um, an airline carrier, for example, yeah. having the right brand, um, the right logo, the mm. right image to match their strategy let's look at um, an individual okay. so number one let's let's forget that you're a celebrity mm. but you want to market and brand yourself why would you want to do that and how do you go about doing that and okay. as an individual do you need to have a look and feel about you as well Absolutely. and that would be I should imagine your logo yes okay so when I first started working for myself I started a company called studio 25 and I branded a company. And I just wasn't, I was battling. I was battling to reach my audience. I was battling to get the clients in. I was battling to create something that people would actually interact with. A little later on, I decided to rebrand and I branded myself, Alessia Pinna, branding and lifestyle strategist. Oh wow. And the response to that has been incredible. Why? Because people want to see who they're working with. They want to know they're being taken care of. So they see me, they see my face, they see my name, and it positions me as an expert in my field. And that is why personal branding is starting to become really, really important because they want to know who they're working with. And in an environment where everything is done digitally and online, this one-on-one -on -one personal connection is exactly what everybody's looking for. And so branding yourself gives those people even from a digital platform a more personal experience let's go to social mm. media networks mm. um, today you can almost you've got overnight uh, celebrity status yes. if you've kind of marketed yourself Correct. in the right way mm. as a blogger or a mm. tweet or whatever it is um, mm. Uh, you know that you wanting to put out into yes. the world mm. but with that is branding and strategy also important Absolutely. or like my previous guest mm. you know she was um, she was retrenched and she needed to do something mm. and she needed to um, kind of steer her uh, artistic energy in a certain direction so she's gone the blowing route and it's worked well mm. for her how important is branding in that scenario exceptionally important because as a blogger whether you're promoting products or selling an opinion you're still having to sell yourself to a certain degree so how you brand yourself becomes exceptionally important is your picture not good enough it's not good enough you need a brand your, your pictures are a small part of your brand branding is not just your, your picture, your logo, the color palette you've chosen, the fonts you've chosen, but it's also about the way that you are messaging 
your um, content, the way you are talking to your audience, um, especially in the realm of social, social media, it's becoming incredibly important to have a consistent, cohesive feed. So nobody wants to log onto Instagram and go look at your feed if it's all over the place. What they're looking for is if your brand colors are soft pinks and pastel colors, you have a pastel inspired uh, feed and the feed has to correspond and be very relevant to what it is that you're blogging about or talking about. If you're a fashion and beauty blogger, your tent and your brand is sort of bright, colorful, happy, smiley colors, your feed would um, sort of correspond to the same feel. The visuals have to create a feeling. Without that feeling, people don't want to connect with you. So especially with blogging, a brand is exceptionally important. In this day and age, we've got overnight, um, in overnight success mm -hmm. stories, very especially with young people via all the social media networks. A lot of them don't have branding. They're just selling themselves or they're out mm -hmm. in this virtual reality space um, on their names alone. Um, do you think that'll make a bigger impact if they brand themselves? Yes, but also I want to bring your attention to these overnight successes. That is a brand. Their name is the brand. Ah, okay. There is a lot of thought behind that. Yes, they might have overnight success, but to maintain that success, to maintain that growth, there's actually a lot of strategy and, and thought out plans behind that. Oh, it hasn't happened by accident. It hasn't happened So if accident. someone comes to you, a young person has this idea that he or she can become an overnight success mm -hmm. via the social media mm -hmm. networks, whatever it is that they try, whatever message they're trying to get mm -hmm. across, what, how long do you sit and work with them? What are the types of criteria you use to create a brand for them and okay. put it out there? So I'll give you an example. I have a friend, she's a, a beauty and lifestyle blogger and she works in the PR industry. She built her brand really, really slowly behind the scenes, but then became an overnight success. No one got to see what was happening behind the scenes, how she was networking with different brands, how she was building herself up as an expert within her field, how she was making contacts through her PR um, abilities to really grow herself. And then when she decided to launch her brand, all of a sudden, wow, she's this massive success and everyone's following her. But it took a lot of work before that actually happened. So my role in something like that would be, okay, let's sit down and decide that once you launch, once you put yourself out there, what is it that you're trying to say? What is the audience you're reaching? How is it that you want to look and especially how do you want to make people feel? And we work on first the personality of the brand and then allow the personality of the brand to shine through to the visuals. We design a logo. We design other collateral that perhaps they're going to need. She goes to a lot of events. She's going to need a business card. Um, she sends a lot of emails to brands and does reviews. So not only would we be branding her blog, but we would be branding her emails as well. We do a photo shoot with her so that she looks professional and she looks like she is an expert in her field. We then talk about a strategy. This is the right time to post on social media. This is the wrong time to post on social media. These are the platforms you actually should be on. And that's a whole strategy all on its own. Okay, we've got two minutes to wrap up time. Mm. What are the do's and don'ts as far as branding is concerned, whether it's for a large corporate or whether it's for a, um, for a private individual? The biggest don't, do not skimp on branding. Your branding should be the most important thing that you do when you start a business the rest will follow. So do not, you pay for what you, you get what you pay for basically. So invest in a good brand strategist, invest in yourself and in your business and value your business enough to hire somebody who's going to get you, get your brand and get your business to where it needs to be. Even if you're a one man business. Even if you're a one man business, even more if you're a one man business because a brand will show you up to be more and perhaps the potential of what you can be. And that's where we leave it. We hope mm. to have you in again very soon yes, to talk definitely. Body Talk, absolutely. which is, sounds absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it is. No time for it today, but very definitely sometime awesome. soon. Awesome. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Ali talking to us about branding, the importance of branding. But there's so much more to this amazing young lady. And she has promised to come in again to talk to us about a whole host of other issues, very especially something called Body Talk. So do watch the space. But it's time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much for your company. Until the next time, a very big thank you for watching. From the Let's Talk team and me, Julie Ali, it is Khuda Hafiz. <laughs>
يا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا 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 ويا هل